Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a lovely black colt called Black Beauty. This was a perfect name for him, for he had the brightest, softest black coat, a beautiful white star in the middle of his forehead, and one white foot. He lived in a lovely green meadow with his mother and several other young colts. They had so much fun together, running and galloping round and round the field. Sometimes, though, their playing was a little rough, for the other colts would bite and kick. So, one day when there was a good deal of kicking going on, Black Beauty's mother whinnied to him to come to her. And she said, I want you to pay attention to what I am going to say. For well, the colts who live here are very good colts, but they haven't learned nice manners. You have been well-bred and well-born. I hope you will go up gentle and good and never learn bad ways. Always obey your master. Do your work with a good will. Lift your feet up well when you trot and never bite or kick, even in play. And Black Beauty never forgot his mother's advice. He was always gentle and kind, did his work well and obeyed all his master's commands immediately. That is, until this one particular evening. In the morning, John the coachman hooked up Black Beauty to the carriage. They were to take Squire Gordon, their master, into town on business. It was raining when they started out and continued to rain very hard all day long. The master's business kept him in town a long time and they weren't able to start for home until evening. By then the wind had grown much stronger and was breaking off branches of trees. I've never been out in such a storm. It's a bad night, John. I wish we were well out of this forest. Aye, sir. Well, it'd be awful bad if a tree came out on top of us. Well, John had barely finished saying this when there was a groan, a crack, and a splitting sound. And crashing down among the other trees was a huge oak tree torn up by the roots. It fell right across the road in front of Black Beauty. That was a narrow escape. Is Black Beauty all right? Oh, yes, sir. He's fine. A little frightened, of course, but he's quietened down. Good. But what are we to do now? Well, sir, we, we can't drive over that tree and we can't get around it. It looks like there's nothing to do but go back to the far crossways. And that's a good six miles before we get to the wooden bridge. It'll be awful late, sir, but Black Beauty can make it. So back they went. But by the time they got to the bridge, it was very dark. And they were trotting along at a good pace, trying to make up time. But the moment Black Beauty's foot touched the first part of the bridge, he came to a dead stop. Go on, Black Beauty. But Black Beauty didn't move. He was sure there was something wrong. He didn't know what it was, but he dared not take another step. Beauty, Beauty, go on, I say. What's the matter with him, John? He's never disobeyed me before. Move on, Beauty. I'll get out and have a look, sir. But I, I don't see anything, sir. He seems all right. Come on, Beauty Pie. I, I'll lead you. What's the matter, Pie? Well, naturally, Black Beauty couldn't tell John what was wrong. But he just knew that the bridge wasn't safe. And he felt so badly. For this was the first time in his life that he had ever disobeyed. All of a sudden, the man in the toll gate on the other side of the bridge ran out, swinging his lantern and yelling, Hey! Hey! Hello! Stop! Don't try to cross! Why, what's the matter? The bridge is broken in the middle! It's been washed away! If you try to cross, you fall into the river! John? John, did you hear that? The bridge is washed out. If it hadn't been for Black Beauty, we would have been drowned. Oh, I should have known that he had a good reason for not obeying my command. Beauty, you're a good horse. You felt something was wrong, and so you were right not to go on. When they finally got home that night, John gave Black Beauty an extra special supper and made him a thick bed of straw and told him over and over what a smart horse he was. About a month later, Black Beauty saved another life. He was awakened by John very late at night. 
Wake up, beauty, wake up, boy. Tonight you must ride as you never have before. Your mistress has been taken ill and we must get the doctor right away. And as quickly as he could, John saddled Black Beauty, jumped on his back, and off they went. Black Beauty had never gone as fast in all his life. For two miles, he galloped like lightning. John was very pleased. Oh, well done, beauty boy. Good old fellow. When they reached the doctor's house, it was all dark and quiet. Everyone was in bed. John anxiously knocked at the door. Finally, a window opened, and Dr. White, in his nightcap, put his head out and said, What do you want? Mrs. Garden is very ill, sir. The master wants you to go at once. He thinks you'll die if you can't get there. Wait just a moment. I'll come right down. And he shut the window and was soon at the door. The worst of it is my horse has been out all day. He's worn out. He won't be about to ride. Would you mind if I take your horse? Oh, he's coming to gallop all the way, sir. I was supposed to give him a rest here. But I'm sure my master won't be angry, especially since his poor wife is so ill. All right, I'll get the rest. So John and Black Beauty waited impatiently for the doctor. And soon he appeared, carrying a riding whip. Oh, you'll not need that, sir. Black Beauty will go till he drops. Take care of him, sir, if you can. I wouldn't want any harm to come to him. I'll be careful, John. And off they went. Now, the doctor was a much heavier man than John, and not as good a rider. But Black Beauty did his best and tried to be careful not to shake the doctor up too much. And soon they arrived home, and the doctor rushed into the house. The groom took Black Beauty, rubbed him down, put warm blankets on him, fed him, and fixed up his bed of straw. And early the next morning, the master came to the stables to see Black Beauty. Ah, oh, my beauty, my good horse. Only a month ago, you saved my life and John's. And last night, you saved the life of your mistress. For if you hadn't brought the doctor back as fast as you did, it would have been too late. Beauty, you're the best horse in the world. And just then, John came in. He had had to walk all the way home from the doctor's. Oh, good morning, sir. I'm glad the mistress is feeling better. And how is Black Beauty this morning? Honestly, sir, I never in my life saw a horse go as fast as he did last night. Why, it was almost as if he knew what was wrong. Of course, Black Beauty did know something was wrong, just as he had known that dark night at the bridge. And Black Beauty was loved and respected all his life by his master, his mistress, and John. Not only because he saved their lives, but mainly because he never forgot his mother's advice. Except for that night at the bridge, he always obeyed his master's commands, did his work well, and was always kind and gentle. Every afternoon on their way home from school, the children used to go to play in the giant's garden. It was a large, lovely garden with soft green grass. Here and there over the grass stood beautiful flowers like stars. And there were twelve peach trees that in the springtime burst into delicate blossoms of pink and white, and in the autumn bore rich fruit. And the birds in the trees sang so sweetly that the children used to stop playing just to listen to them. One day, the giant decided to return to his castle. He had been away for several years. And when he arrived, he saw the children playing in the garden. What are you doing here? My garden is my own garden. Anyone can understand that. And I will allow nobody to play in it but myself. So he built a high wall all round it put up a large sign. No children allowed. He was a very selfish giant. And the poor children now had no place to play. They tried to play on the road, but the road was very dusty and full of hard stones, and they didn't like it. And they used to wander around the high wall when their lessons were over and talk about the beautiful garden inside.
And then the spring came, and all over the country there were little blossoms and little birds. But in the garden of the selfish giant it was still winter. The birds didn't care to sing in it, for there were no children, and the trees refused to blossom. And once a beautiful flower put its head up from the grass. But when it saw the large sign saying, No children allowed, it felt so sorry for the children that it popped back into the ground again and went off to sleep. The only people who were pleased were the snow and the frost. Spring will not come to this garden, so we will live here all the year round. The snow covered up the grass with her great white cloak, and the frost painted all the trees silver. And then they invited the north wind to stay with them, and he came. He was wrapped in furs, and he roared all day about the garden. Oh, this is a delightful spot. We must ask the hail on a visit. And so the hail came, and every day for three hours he rattled on the roof of the castle. And then he ran round and round the garden as fast as he could go. He was dressed in gray, and his breath was like ice. And the giant sat looking out his window at his cold, white garden. I cannot understand why the spring is so late in coming. I hope there will be a change in the weather. But the spring never came, nor the summer. And the autumn gave golden fruit to every garden, but to the giant's garden she gave none. So it was always winter there, and the north wind and the hail and the frost and the snow danced about through the trees. One morning the giant was lying in bed when he heard some lovely music. It sounded so sweet to his ears that he thought it must be the king's musicians passing by. But it was really only a little bird singing outside his window. But it was so long since he had heard a bird sing in his garden that it seemed to him to be the most beautiful music in the world. And suddenly, the hail stopped dancing over his head, the wind ceased roaring, and a delicious perfume came to him through the open window. I believe the spring has come at last. <laughs> He jumped out of bed and looked out. What did he see? A most wonderful sight. Through a little hole in the wall, the children had crept in, and they were sitting in the branches of the trees. And in every tree that he could see, there was a little child. And the trees were so glad to have the children back again that they had covered themselves with blossoms and were waving their arms gently above the children's heads. And the birds were flying about and twittering with delight. And the flowers were looking up through the green grass and laughing. It was a lovely scene. Only in one corner it was still winter. It was the father's corner of the garden, and in it was standing a little boy. He was so small that he couldn't reach up to the branches of the tree, and he was wandering all around it, crying bitterly. The poor tree was still quite covered with frost and snow, and the north wind was blowing and roaring above it. Climb up, little boy, said the tree, and it bent its branches down as low as it could. But the boy was too tiny, and the giant's heart melted as he looked out. How selfish I have been. Now I know why the spring would not come here. I will put that poor little boy on the top of the tree, and then I will knock down the wall, and my garden shall be the children's playground forever and ever. So he crept downstairs and opened the front door quite softly and went out into the garden. But when the children saw him, they were so frightened that they all ran away, and the garden became winter again. Only the little boy did not run for his eyes were so full of tears that he didn't see the giant coming. And the giant stole up behind him and took him gently in his hand and put him up into the tree. And the tree burst once again into blossom, and the birds came and sang on it, and the little boy stretched out his two arms and flung them round the giant's neck and kissed him. 
And the other children, when they saw that the giant wasn't wicked any longer, came running back. And with them came the spring. It is your garden now, little children. And then he took a great axe and knocked down the wall and threw away the sign. And when the people were going to market, they found the giant playing with the children in the most beautiful garden they had ever seen. And Spring remained in his garden forevermore. And he was never called the selfish giant again. Many years ago, the Emperor of China had the most beautiful palace in the world, and his garden was full of flowers, plants, and grass like green velvet. The loveliest flowers had little silver bells attached to them, so that everyone would be sure to see them as they passed. Actually, the garden was so large that even the gardener didn't know where it ended. And surrounding the garden was a huge forest of trees, and at the end of that was the most wonderful deep blue sea. In one of the trees in the forest lived a nightingale, whose song was so marvelous that everyone stopped to listen. And travelers from all over the world came to visit the emperor's kingdom, and they admired everything very much. But when they heard the nightingale, they said, This is the best of all. Many books were written about the Emperor's palace, garden, forest, and sea, but mainly they praised the wonderful nightingale. One day the Emperor was reading one of these books, when all of a sudden he exclaimed, What is this? The nightingale? Why, I never heard of it. Can there be a bird in my kingdom, in my own garden, that I do not know about? Imagine my having to find this out from a book. Then he immediately summoned his chief minister to appear before him. This book says that there is a wonderful bird called a nightingale here, and that it is better than anything else in all my great kingdom. Why have I never been told about it? Oh, I have never heard it mentioned. It has never been presented at court. I wish it to appear here this evening to sing to me. The whole world knows what I am possessed of, and I know nothing about it. I insist upon its being here tonight. I will hear this nightingale. I extend my most gracious protection to it. But if it does not appear, I will have you severely punished after supper. Oh, Ching Pu, I will seek it. I will find it. And away he ran upstairs and downstairs and in and out of all the rooms and corridors of the huge palace. He asked all the courtiers and ladies in waiting, but none had ever heard of the nightingale. But at last, he found a poor little maid in the kitchen who said, The nightingale? Oh, yes. I know it very well. It did it can sing. Every evening, I go for a walk. And when I get tired, I sit and rest in the forest. And then I hear the nightingale sing. Its song brings the tears into my eyes. Oh, little kitchen maid, I will get you a permanent position in the kitchen and permission to see the emperor dining if you will please take me to the nightingale. His highness commands you to appear at court tonight. So off they went into the forest where the nightingale usually sang. As they were hurrying along, a cow began to bellow. There we have it. Oh, what a wonderful power for such a little creature. I have certainly heard it before. No, that is a cow bellowing. We're a long way yet from the place. Then the frogs began to croak in the marsh. Oh, how beautiful. It is uh, just like the tinkling of church bells. Oh, no. Those are the frogs. But I think we shall soon hear it now. Yes, listen, listen. There it is, that little gray bird in the branches of that tree. Is it possible? I sure never have thought it was like that. Oh, how common it looks. Well, 
Seeing me in my fine clothes must have frightened its colors away. A little nightingale, our gracious emperor wishes you to sing to him. Just like Crystal Bell. It is extraordinary we have never heard it before. Well, I am sure it will be a great success at court. Hmm. Oh, my a precious little nightingale, I have the honor to command your attendance at a court festival tonight. From His Gracious Majesty the Emperor with your fascinating singing. So the nightingale appeared at court. And the palace was decorated as never before with golden lamps and the beautiful flowers with the bells attached. Everybody was there dressed in his very best. Even the little kitchen maid was allowed to stand behind the door, for she now had the title of cook. And the nightingale sang delightfully, and the tears rolled down the emperor's cheeks. And the emperor was so charmed that he offered the nightingale his most precious emerald necklace to wear about its neck. But the nightingale declined. I have seen tears in the eyes of the emperor. That is my richest reward. For the tears of an emperor have a wonderful power. I am sufficiently repaid. And the nightingale was a great success. So he was to stay at court now. One day the emperor received a gift from the emperor of Japan. It was an artificial nightingale. Exactly like the living one, except that it was covered with diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. When it was wound up, it actually sang a song. The emperor was so happy with his new present that he gave another big party so that all could see and hear the new nightingale. Well, everyone thought it even better than the real one because it sang the same song over and over again, and they were able to sing it too. Also, it looked much more beautiful. But then the emperor said, Now uh, the real nightingale must have his turn. But no one had noticed that it had flown out of the open window back to its own green woods. Well, everyone decided it was a very ungrateful bird, but that they had the best one after all. So the real nightingale was banished from the kingdom. The artificial bird had its place on a silken cushion close to the emperor's bed. And for a year, everything went well. The artificial bird sang every night, and the people sang with it. But one evening, something gave way inside the bird. And the music stopped. The emperor called for his private physicians, but they couldn't do anything. Finally, a watchmaker repaired the bird but he warned the emperor that it could only sing once a year. Five years passed and a great sadness came upon the kingdom. The emperor whom they loved very much had taken ill and could not live. He lay pale and cold in his gorgeous bed. He could hardly breathe. He seemed to have a weight on his chest. He opened his eyes and saw death sitting there. All around the bed were curious faces, some very ugly and others very beautiful. They were the emperor's good and bad deeds. Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Do you remember this? No. No. Music. Music. Sound the great drums that I may not hear what they are saying. Music. Oh, you precious little golden bird. Sing. Sing. But the bird stood silent. There was nobody to wind it up, for everyone had thought the emperor was dead. So they had gone to pay their respects to the new emperor. Suddenly, through the window came a lovely song. It was the real nightingale. He had heard of the emperor's need and had come to bring comfort and hope to him. And as he sang, the faces of the good and bad deeds started to fade, and the emperor felt himself growing stronger. Even death listened and said, 
Go on, little nightingale. Go on. Yes, if you give me the golden sword. Yes, if you give me the imperial banner. Yes, if you give me the emperor's crown. And death gave back each of these treasures for a song. And like a cold gray mist, he floated out the window. Thank you, you heavenly little bird. I banished you from my kingdom, and yet you have charmed the evil visions away from my bed, even death away from my heart. How can I ever repay you? You have rewarded me. I brought tears to your eyes the very first time I ever sang to you, and I shall never forget it. Those are the jewels which gladden the heart of a singer. You must stay with me always. Sing only when you like. I will break the artificial bird into a thousand pieces. Don't do that. It did all the good it could. Keep it as you always have. I can't live in the palace, but let me come when I can. Then I'll sing to you to cheer you, and to make you thoughtful, too. I'll sing of the happy ones, and of those that suffer, of good and evil, which are kept hidden from you. I love your heart more than your crown. I will come, and I will sing to you. But you must promise me one thing. Everything. Only one thing I ask. Tell no one that you have a little bird who tells you everything. It will be better so. <laughs> then the nightingale flew away. In a little while, the people of the court came in to tend to their dead emperor. But there he stood, smiling and bidding them good morning. This is the story of Schnapps and the Magic Button. Now, Schnapps is a real live dog, a red dachshund. You know, one of those long, long dogs with beautiful silky ears and lovely brown eyes. Everybody smiles when they see him trotting down the street with his long, firm little body in a bright green sweater, looking for all the world like a teddy bear. Well, his mistress works all day, so Schnapps is alone, except when Mr. Danders, the superintendent, takes him for a walk at noon. Now, on this particular day, his mistress had just left, so Schnapps settled down next to his bed. And he crossed his front legs and put his long nose over his toes and sighed a perfectly long sigh of boredom. Oh. He started to think about what he was going to do. He had a long day before him. He couldn't read a book or write a letter, and he just didn't feel like chewing on an old bone. No, Schnapps wanted to do something. Just as he sighed a second time, Oh, something tickled his nose. He thought a fly had gotten into the apartment, so he growled and snapped, but was he surprised when he saw what was standing in front of him? It was a little green man with a long feather in his hand. This feather was attached to a little blue hat, which the man clapped right on top of his head. Well, right then, Schnapps knew that he was in for something different especially when the little green man started talking to him. Hello, old fellow. I'm bored, too, just as bored as you. The only difference between us is that I can do something about it, and I'm going to. And he opened his lavender-colored coat, and Schnapp saw a lovely brown vest with all different colored buttons on it. The little man pulled off one of the buttons and twisted it at the end to make a loop. Then he fastened it to Schnapsy's collar and said, This is a magic button. You may not believe it, Schnapps, but you can talk to me now. A magic button? Talk? Well, Schnapsy sat up and opened his mouth. Arf! Arf! Hello! 
Poor Schnapsy was so surprised he automatically put his paw in front of his mouth. He was just about the most surprised dog in the world. My name is Bounce, and I'm a fairy's helper. My boss went out too and left me alone, just like you. It was such a nice day that I started to slide down on a sunbeam and found myself coming right in your window. <laughs> I almost landed on top of your nose. <laughs> you understand now, Schnapps? You won't be able to talk to anybody but me. But anytime you want me, all you have to do is sigh and touch the magic button, and I'll come down for a visit. Wowee! I bet I'm the first dog in the world that ever said wowee. You sure are. Now, uh, what shall we do? Well, Schnopsy sat up and scratched his ear with his hind foot. He thought and thought and thought. You know, Bounce, what you said about riding on sunbeams sounds wonderful to me. Could I do it? I mean, could we go riding on sunbeams together for a little while? Huh, could we? Sure. It's the easiest thing in the world for me. And now you have the magic button. It'll be easy for you, too. Say, Schnapps, do you mind if I ride on your back? I think it'll be easier that way, uh, to get you started, I mean. Oh, sure, but let's go. Let's go now. So, with a little leap into the air, Bounce landed on Schnapps and grabbed hold of his collar. Yeah. Now, Schnapps, when I say go, you jump right up into the air and we'll be off. One, two, three, go! <laughs> And with that, Schnapps jumped right up into the air, landed on a sunbeam, and out the window they flew. Wowee! Just like floating on a cloud. Boy, this beast's riding in a car, even a sports model. Wowee! I wish my mistress could see me now. Say, Bounce, can anybody see us? <laughs> We'd look awfully funny flying around like a couple of birds. Well, Schnapps, the only people that can see us are little boys and girls, and they'd know that we're just having lots and lots of fun. As a matter of fact, they'd like to be flying around like we're doing, too. Say, Bounce, why don't we open a factory and make magic buttons for all the little boys and girls in the world? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it, huh, Bounce? No, no, I don't think so, Schnapsy because then there wouldn't be any boys and girls on the ground, and their mothers and fathers would be heartbroken. But it might be a good thing to give some of the boys and girls magic buttons. Maybe we will. Not right now, though, but we'll think about it. Oh, isn't this fun just gliding along? Oh, yes. You know, Bounce, every once in a while, my mistress takes me up to Boston with her, and I have to get into a big black box. Gee, I feel like I've been locked in a closet. And then I'm carried down to a taxi and out to the airport. And I have to wait with a lot of packages until the plane's ready. And then they put me in the tail section with all the luggage. And the engines roar and the plane takes off. And for an hour, I'm tossed around in my box just like an old chip of wood in the water. Enough to make you seasick. And when we land... Well, it takes me quite a while just to be able to stand on my feet again. Boy, wouldn't it be something next time for me to say, I'll meet you in Boston and take off by myself? It sure would. I can see you circling the field right now. Using your tail as an aerial. Come in, Boston Airport. Come in, Boston Airport. This is Snubsy, circling overhead at 2,000 feet, requesting permission to land. What are your instructions? Over, Roger, we'll go and out. And then when the people in the control tower get over their surprise at hearing you talk to them, they all run out on the field to see the first New York to Boston run of a flying dachshund. Can you imagine the crowds watching you land? The boys and girls crying out to you, Schnapsy, Schnapsy, pull in your ear flaps. Oh boy, what fun that would be. Look, Schnapps, you call me when you're going to Boston the next time and, and we'll see what can be arranged. 
But now, let's practice some more sunbeam flying. Hey, you just missed that church steeple back there and almost hit a pigeon taking off. Hmm, isn't this great? We don't have to stop for gas and we can never get a flat tire. We don't even have to trade in our sunbeams every year for new ones. Huh? <laughs> sunbeams never go out of style. Whee! This is the most fun I ever had. Yeah. Oh, say, Schnapps, doesn't Mr. Danders take you out at 12? Sure, exactly at 12. Well, we have just 10 minutes to get home. So Schnapps and his new friend Bounce transferred from the slow local sunbeams to the fast express sunbeams, and back home they flew and landed in Schnapps' bed just as Mr. Danders was putting the key in the door. So long, Schnapps. See you soon. Be a good boy. And off he went. Mr. Danders came in and said hello to Schnapps and asked him if he'd been behaving himself. Schnapps wagged his tail, looked up at Mr. Danders and said, I sure have. But all that really came out was a soft bark that changed into a whine. And Mr. Danders laughed and said, <laughs> Trying to talk to me, huh? Ah, you're a cute little fella, Schnapps. Now, here's your leash. Just let me snap this on and out we go. Hey, what's this little button doing on your collar? I, no, no, I'd better leave it. Probably your mistress put it there. And that's how Schnapps got his magic button. Now, if you're very, very good and do as your mummy and daddy tell you, maybe Bounce will slide down a sunbeam into your house and give you a magic button. And then you could ride on a sunbeam just like schnapps. Now, wouldn't that be fun?